Welcome to the Proceedings Podcast. I'm Bill Hamlet, the Editor-in-Chief of Proceedings at the U.S. Naval Institute. It is great to be here at Modern Day Marine recording a couple episodes of the podcast from the floor of the Convention Center. Uh, what a terrific show. I have not been here before. Uh, I've been to Modern Day Marines, but they were always at Quantico, yeah, uh, right. often in uh, sort of muddy fields Indeed. and under tents. Indeed. And here at the Washington Convention Center, uh, this is a great show on par with our Naval Institute FC at West that we do in San Diego every year. So I want to just congratulate the Marine Corps Association for a terrific show and speakers and floor exhibits, etc. Uh, my guest for this episode is Lieutenant Colonel Scott Como. He's a Marine Infantry Officer. He is on uh, the Undersecretary of Defense for Policy staff right now, but he's a, a Marine Infantry guy who has been intimately involved in Force Design 2030 the, the evolution of the thinking that's gone into that, a lot of the experimentation, both at headquarters Marine Corps, down at, down at Quantico, and, and also uh, out in the field last year with this thing called Task Force 61 2 uh, over in the MED, working for uh, in, in the European theater, working for, uh, for Sixth Fleet. Right. So um, this morning on my way in on the Metro, I was reading the article that you wrote in. Um, in, in War on the Rocks last year. By the way, this guy is a uh, he's a rock star. <laughs> no, he's got Marines coming by, fist pumping him. Um, but uh, Scott, your article was called On the Ground Truth and Force Design 2030 Reconciliation, A Way Forward. So uh, there's been a lot of criticism uh, you know, in the news, especially by older, retired -er Marines, right, about Force Design 2030. I just want to talk, you know you to talk a little bit about the genesis. Like, yeah. how did we get to Force Design 2030? Because it didn't just start with General Berger. Yeah. Okay. Well, sir, thank you, obviously, for having me and everybody for listening. Proceedings and the Naval Institute has been, as I was mentioning to you, over, over two decades now, has had a huge impact on how I think about things, the, the authors, it, it, everything to do. This question on... Right now, as General Berger has helped you know, kind of take the next step for the Marine Corps, integration with the Navy, I, I would say if you look back at the Marine Corps' history, it's just the next evolutionary step. There's been a good bit of tension about the why and what's the foundation of it, and is this the General Berger plan without anybody else's input? And I think that's really unfortunate because we're missing sometimes in this discussion, like kind of take maybe for this discussion here, let's just go back to the 2018 National Defense Strategy. Exactly, yeah. General Secretary Mattis, so I had the privilege to serve as a rifle platoon commander, cap platoon commander, company XO for General Mattis in Iraq. When I went to the infantry officer course, uh, he was the McSiddick or the Combat Development Integration Corps. So basically from 2002 until 2008, in some form or fashion, General Mattis was, you know, in my chain of command and heavily influenced how I think about the world and see the world. So he's the Secretary of Defense in 2018. When I'm fighting in Iraq, General Dunford was initially 5th Marines, and he was the Chief of Staff. I can remember days being in fights and the receiving end of radio is Colonel Dunford and then Brigadier General Dunford. And so they're in charge, respectively, of the Joint Staff in General Dunford's case and OSD writ large, the entire department, Secretary Mattis. And when they come out with the 2018 National Defense Strategy, the Associated Joint Strategy, they, they do a couple of things. They identify now, you know, seven years later, it's China's the pacing threat, China's the pacing threat. That wasn't a 2022 NDS. That wasn't a Biden administration. That started under Secretary Mattis, Chairman Dunford. Frank Hoffman, who has written countless articles in proceedings over the years, is one of the key guys behind the scenes writing the strategy, laying out yeah. what, what Frank has had a profound, if you, if you just kind of unpack and look at American history and look at, our, look at the threats to our country over time, the Soviet Union, it's tough because of the data that you'd get from the Soviet Union, but basically, if we think 1980-ish time frame, Shah has fallen, OPEC crisis, and you remember one of my favorite movies, the ice hockey movie, The Miracle, like America, are we gonna win this Cold War thing? At that time, the Soviet Union might have had 40% of our GDP, might. Right. There's some debate. Right. Now, depending on how you measure it, China's purchasing power pack is greater than ours. Military threat, what it's done in the Western Pacific, especially for a naval force, changed the entire dynamic of what we're doing. And that strategy laid all of that out, 
and then told the Navy and Marine Corps, you are to adjust yourself, not because anybody did anything wrong in Iraq or Afghanistan. Right. The nation needed us, and, and, I, and I was blessed to serve amazing young Marines and sailors and sometimes soldiers who did wonderful things on the ground. But the strategic guidance said, pause, shift, Western Pacific is the priority. Certainly China is a global threat, but in the Western Pacific where America since 1783 arguably has said there will not be a hegemon in the Western Pacific, period, the end, and we have gone to war repeatedly to include employing atomic weapons. You have associated uh, strategic guidance documents come out that tell the Marine Corps increase naval, like really increase naval integration. Don't build a PowerPoint brief. Yeah. Staffs are integrated. You're operating together. You know, we'll talk about Task Force 61 slash 2 later. You're going to do reconnaissance and sensing missions. And those sensing missions, whereas in Iraq and Afghanistan, you may have been reporting to a one-star Marine general or two-star Marine general. You might now be sharing sensor data with a destroyer, with a submarine. And in some cases, yeah. it was a variety of different with it. When Seven, we're in, Seventh so, Fleet, CSG. Bingo. All, right. all of that. And you, the information is going to be fused and serve, in some cases, fleet commanders. And you're going to be focused increasingly on how do you do that against PLAN and PLA Marine Corps assets. That started long before General Berger became the commandant. And when General Berger is nominated to be the commandant, that's the strategic guidance. And of course, that has not only continued, it has been accelerated with the 22 NDS. Um, a couple of months back in, in the billet, you asked, um, so I'm inside of OSD policy. And a couple of months back, a uh, faculty group from the Army War College came down and they asked a similar question. Come in and they got essentially a six year rewind of all the strategic guidance. And they're like, and then their conclusion was all General Berger is doing is what he was ordered to do. Your article in War on the Rocks, you had, you had a couple of tidbits that really stood out for me. One was that the that Marine Corps made the decision, and I think this even predated General uh, Berger, uh, of the, the M1A1 tank having to upgrade it. It would have been very costly, both in uh, dollars, but also in weight, uh, to, to upgrade it for the types of threats that we're seeing play out against armored vehicles in Ukraine. A thousand or so Russian tanks have, 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 have learned that, that you know, if it comes from above, and it can even be something as simple as you know, a grenade drop from yes. a small UAS, right? But if it comes from above, your, your tank is much more vulnerable than something that might be coming at you laterally. Yes, and, the, and the Marines M1A1 tanks weren't ready for that. M1A2 version upgrading to that would have been expensive, but also would have been expensive in fuel, in ship to shore connectors. Yes, so talk about that just a little bit. Yeah. I First of all, I love tanks. I don't know if I'd be talking to you right now yeah. if it weren't for incredibly on the march up to Baghdad, first tanks and second tanks, crews saved my Marines' asses repeatedly. I mean, sorry for the language. Go back to Iraq as a Cap platoon commander, uh, fighting in the Jaffa in August 04. It's 130 degrees out, the world's biggest cemetery. And we had four tanks. And back to this kind of question of tank upgrade, you know, maybe for the audience, this may sound you're kind of going on a little bit of a journey here. So imagine, put yourself, you're in a place called Najaf, the world's largest Shia cemetery, and you're fighting, you have four tanks, 1,200 Marines and an infantry battalion landing team that have sailed over to Iraq. Knee deep, you've lost the battalion. We lost 10% casualties in the unit. And as we were fighting in those initial days, I remember over Battalion TAC-1, the battalion command net, Tiger was our tank call sign. And the four tank crews, you, you can't be more heroic, more courageous. Now, over Battalion TAC, we're about, I don't know, 48 hours into the fight, got a lot of guys hurt, and Tiger comes over the net and says, I got to check off the line. So they're in our forwardmost position, tanks getting shot by RPGs, 7.62 fire, 50 cal fire. We're fighting six and seven story hotels or surrounding the cemetery. My tank crews have to check off the line because they're heat casualties. And I'm in a thin skinned Humvee or jumping out of the Humvee to get to the positions to employ heavy machine guns. And everybody heard the 70 ton tank crew in this heinous fight say, I have to back off the lines. 
what I discovered about two weeks later, when you, toward the, the, the battle hit kind of a culminating point, and then we were reinforced by 27 and 15 Cav, is our tanks did not have air conditioning. Oh. Sounds probably weak for a Marine infantryman to say air conditioning, but when you're inside, because you're dealing with top down threats, sometimes when you see a tank, like if you Google M1 tank and you pull up images, you're probably going to see the tank crew, the tank commander's head up outside the tank. You're going to see the driver popped up. Well, when you're in a, a, a dense urban area in a fight and there's fire from down, you're sealed up because you get shot in the head. It's that simple. So the tank crew is all buttoned up inside the tank. The tank doesn't have any air conditioning. It's 130 degrees outside. And so, yes, so ultimately the tank crews had to pull out, they basically pulled back to our casualty collection point, put the IVs in their arm and they left the kit and they'd go fight for an hour, they'd come back, put a new IV bag to fight and this is what they had to do. And then two weeks later, the Army shows up, 1-5 Cav and 2-7 Cav show up with upgraded tanks with air conditioning. They never needed to check off the lines. Simple thing, not a typical Marine tough guy thing to talk about, yet facts. So now let's fast forward to Ukraine. Commandants from General Berger at CMC 38 back to General Neller's 37, General Dunford at 36. We've been dealing with this for about 10 to 12 years as the threat from top-down munitions kept rising. What are you going to do about this? And most of the listeners are probably familiar with the Israeli trophy system that they basically in the West Bank and Gaza put a top-down if you had UAVs coming down or you had RPGs in and basically that trophy system would detect all the threats and automatically AI, it would automatically respond. Well, that's, you know, that might be a sentence or two in an article, but what tangible that means? You're putting three to 4,000 more pounds on top of the tank, and then you need the power upgrades to wow. power all these systems. So our tanks, as a naval force, you want to put an LCAC on the back into the well deck of any L-class ship, you're talking a tank on an LCAC. Well, if I put the M1 A2 SEP4 uh, survivability enhancement package version 4 on that LCAC, the LCAC's not moving. If I move it, wow. let's for argument's sake say I put the, I pull, you know, in, you know I'm a boast East, East and West Coast Marine, I pull the, uh, the, the L-class ship into Moorhead City and I load the tanks there. Okay. Well, now the center of gravity of the ship, because the tank weighs so much, so the decisions had been made long before General Berger became the commandant. Hey, we're not going to upgrade this because don't work on LCACs. They don't work on the ships. Is this the right investment? And so the Ukraine conflict happens, and we have, you know, whatever pushes, however you want to think about it, this top-down threat, whether that's sensors, then guiding, you know, unguided, guiding dumb artillery, but now that has a 10-digit grid coordinated associated with it. Yep. Like, is this the right investment to make? Talk a little bit about, because this is another thing that came out in your article, is, uh, and it, it, I don't think it's covered well, uh, at least not in the broad press, right, uh, when they talk about force design and where the Marine Corps is going, EA, EABO and all those things. But you, you bring out the point in your War on the Rocks article that the average Marine today is more lethal at 10 times the range because of the systems that you are bringing in, that the Marine Corps is investing in. And, and as I walked the floor here yesterday, uh, you know, there's the number of companies that are selling small UASs. I mean, all the way up to Reaper stuff, size, you know, UASs, but small things that you can, you know, launch from, a Marine can launch from their hand uh, to medium size. Uh, that's pretty impressive to me. And your article also mentioned that this was published a year ago that by the end of last year, there would be about 3,700 new UASs in the hands of Marines across the force, right? So that's big. Yeah. And, and you see it playing out, the, the, need, the, uh, the need for that on the battlefield in Russia, Ukraine yeah, right now, right? right? So uh, talk about how, you know, today's Marine is more lethal at longer range yeah. than, than five years ago. Yeah, no, th thanks again for the question, sir. So if, if I could go back in time, you know, four years, and it was like, and, and we're working on this in headquarters right now, there's images that got, like, associated with force design right off the bat. It was like a long-range anti-ship missile system in the Philippines. Like, if you, if you say a lot of, like, pictures worth a thousand words, 
right off the bat in 2019 or so, images were presented that have led people to believe all General Berger and Force Design is about is getting anti-ship missile capabilities in the Philippines. That is <laughs> in no way, shape, or form. And I've shared with some folks, you, you know, I've, I've had the opportunity and the privilege to write for Proceedings, for Gazette, for War on the Rocks. When General Mattis had the Close Combat Lethality Task Force when he was the Secretary of Defense, you can find my name, and the only reason I bring this up in response to this question, essentially diming out the Marine Corps for not making the investments in the infantry that I thought it should make. So I've said to people that have made accusations that General Berger's destroying the infantry, I've got all sorts of weaknesses. I've done all sorts of things wrong. If General Berger was destroying the infantry, I would be the first person on the top of the hill screaming out loud about it, and I'm not. Why not? Because to your point, sir, let's just take some tangible examples. The infantry officer course, near and dear to my heart, is now two weeks longer than it was when General Berger became the commandant. Perhaps even well more important than that, the School of Infantry, some changes at the School of Infantry. That is three to four weeks longer, depending on, and you know this, from the human cost from the Navy, the Marine Corps, all the services to make investments in the training time to have a Marine in school instead of in the Fleet Marine Force. All right, so, so the schools are longer. The equipment that we have pushed down to the schools, some changes that our uh, ACMAC talk about with talent management. Basically, if you're, uh, let's say you're 10 Marines, you show up to the School of Infantry, you are now in the same squad, and you go to the same battalion together. So that semblance oh. of cohesion, which some would be like, wait a sec, prior to 2020, you were just shotgunning Marines randomly to any battalion? Yeah, and I'm not saying who, who did that was wrong. I'm saying what General Berger has done just from first focusing on the human, the quote-unquote talent managers, like, wait a sec, what if we make the infantry training longer? What if we, and this is Secretary Mattis and General Scales has written for Proceedings a Bunch, talking about the human dimension, cohesive units on an increasingly distributed battlefield are going to, when, when they've got to make decisions, it, it's a simplistic communication because they've been together longer is going to be increasingly important. And then you bring it into your question about 10 times longer the range. So in the Marine Infantry, since 1981, I believe, the kind of the, the, the graduate for, for a company level, if you're a good company or you're a good platoon, you go to 29 Palms and you execute range 400 for a company and you execute range 410 Alpha. And that's their trenches with Ivan pop-up targets that you have to coordinate a whole bunch of fires on and then maneuver on top of. And when you're on, sometimes you fix bayonets and you're stabbing the... And it's all well and good. But if you can kill that stuff from 10 kilometers away, instead of having to write letters home to mom and dad, like why wouldn't you say, hey, I can kill these enemies of our country from 10 kilometers away with a lot of the technologies that you're seeing here and you're seeing on a battlefield in Ukraine. Now, I do want to caveat back to the human dimension first. Some of the criticism that General Berger has received is, hey, what if it's 35 knot winds and it's raining out, these loitering munitions might not work. Nobody has ever said they're gonna work in every single condition. And I think sometimes, and I often say, hey, D-Day was on 6 June, 1944 for a reason. If weather wasn't a problem, it would have been on 2 June. It would have been, and so weather's gonna, but it goes back to the first investment that General Berger has made, and General Smith and Tess, the Assistant Commandant for, as Talent Management Lead, get the human capabilities, which are already incredibly capable, raise that game so if it's 30 mile an hour winds and you can't employ these capabilities and these young marines and increasingly more mature marines of the the efforts to move they can make they're more cohesive they've had more reps and sets together and they can figure out the different tools at the battlefield somehow i don't know why that's been lost in the discussion but that, hopefully that helps answer the question sir last question and, and you wrote about this uh with a co-author for proceedings last year uh, there's been a lot of discussion about it, but I, I don't feel like I know the details well enough, but there's Task Force 61-2 or slash 2 uh, in the UCOM AOR 2022. You went forward uh, and you did some operations under the 6th Fleet Commander, and it was a lot of reconnaissance and counter-reconnaissance using some of the new tools that the Marine Corps has fielded. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah. What were some lessons and, and some, perhaps some... Uh, feedback that's applicable specifically for 
three MEF and for seven fleet out in the Western Pacific. No, abs absolutely, sir. So did, before diving into it, 612, General Donovan, ACMAC, General Smith, and certainly all based on the Commandant's guidance. But since that deployment went, you can, you know, for listeners, Google Task Force 76 slash 3. We basically iterated that and combined 7th Fleet and aspects of 3rd, 3MEF uh, and 3rd MEB. So from, for the listeners, YES 61 slash 2 is the integration of 6th Fleet and the amphibious components. That's, you get 612. Since then, we have 763, and that builds a lot on 51.5. So it's going you know, to kind of come back, what are we trying to do? And, and let's, I think helpful to think about this from the context of what is force design and where in the evolution of where the Marine Corps has been. You can go back 20 years worth the Commandant saying, hey, when we transition out of Iraq and Afghanistan, the importance of greater naval integration is going to go through the roof. Every commandant, don't care. You can find you can find them all saying it. Going back to the two, the first question to the 2018 National Defense Strategy, increased naval integration, the growing threat from the PLAN and the PLAN Marine Corps to include together the speed of conflict as we're seeing play out in the Ukrainian battlefield, information flying. We don't have time to have a separate, you know, Marine chain of command, Navy chain of command operationally. What are, where do you route all the sensing data? Where do you, how do you run the quote unquote kill chain? So at 612, General Frank Donovan, General Donovan, his first, I think I'm getting this right, his first one star tour, he was the commander of Task Force 515, working for then Rear Admiral Upper Half Black, I believe, as the Nav Sent Deputy. Okay. Now Vice Admiral Black, the N3, N5 in the building, was the Sixth Fleet Commander two years ago. You have decades worth of, sorry for the table again, we have to increase naval integration, we have to figure out how to distribute forces because of greater threats from missiles and sensors coming, coming at us. The Marine Corps War Fighting Lab, which is all around us, making investments in the C2 systems, the sensing capabilities, the fires capabilities, these are decades worth of investments. General Donovan has a relationship with Admiral Black. The Commandant specifically tasked 2nd Marine Division and 2MEF to increase naval integration with real-world experimentation. General Donovan and General Journey, who was the 2MEF commander at the time, have conversations with Admiral Black, and you know this, sir. Hey, instead of doing, I don't mean it maliciously, a one-off kind of contained experiment off of Virginia Beach or off of North Carolina, there's a war going on. Putin further invaded Ukraine on 20... We have all these maritime domain awareness gaps in the Baltic Sea, in the Aegean Sea, in the Baltic Sea. The U.S. Naval Forces destroyers, there's not enough of them to cover down on all of them. Frank, to, this is Admiral Black to General Donovan. Frank, can you do some of this RXR, recon, counter-recon stuff over here? General Donovan subsequently tasked down to us to figure out how to do it. This is like mission-type orders to young Marines. Hey, I, 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 just for the purpose of this podcast and the time, I won't. This is General Donovan pushing down to Lance Corporals and Corporals. Hey, we need to figure out how to take commercial, like literally commercial, that you go up and down the Potomac, take a commercial maritime radar. I want to put small teams across the Baltic Sea and move the sensing data to destroyers, to the Sixth Fleet Maritime Operations Center, to track what the Russian fleet is doing. No lieutenant standing there, no captains, no. This goes back to General Krulak when he's commandant, writing about the strategic corporal. I had the privilege to lead corporals and sergeants who were distributed literally 30, 40, 50 miles across Estonia, tracking what the Russians are doing and moving data straight back to Admiral Black. And General Donovan tells his story, I mean, you'd appreciate this. Admiral Black, like, Frank, is this stuff going to work? And we don't know, we're going fast. And he's like, so I don't know. The corporal said it's going to work. We did some experimentation, and we wrote about it in that one proceedings article. Yep. Um, it, stateside, I don't know, sir. It worked the last time, and we go. So General Donovan and Admiral Black are in the mock in Naples. And you had this maritime domain awareness gap in the ball. But basically, so imagine you're Admiral Black, and you do not know what the Russian fleet is doing to the degree that you want to know. So you go to sleep. You walk into your maritime operations center and you got these information gaps. You wake up and these small teams of Marines from the mobile reconnaissance element from 2nd Marine Division have showed up in Estonia, distributed essentially at the squad level 
across the country and you wake up and now you're seeing link tracks all over and Admiral Black looks at Franklin or to General Donovan like, what the hell is this? So, so this is RXR. He's like, I want more of this. And so this has continued and the young Marines have taken these commercial sensor, uh, sensors, they've taken small software projects with groups of three or four Marines working with industry. And right now they're over and they're doing the same thing in 763 right now. The majority of the Marines that were employed and right now are across Estonia, across Lithuania. They were 03 infantry Marines, that these are not people you want to walk down a dark alley at night and pick a fight. Yes. Can they operate communications equipment and sensor? Yes. Can they still shoot you in the face if they have to? Yes. Hi. Well, this is a great conversation. We're here at Modern Day Marine. Scott Como, great to, to meet you in person. Thanks thank for you, writing for proceedings. No, thank you, and, sir. And for being here for the show today and for all you're doing for the Marine Corps. Uh, and uh, I will tell the, the Navy audience for next year, because this will this will get posted next week uh, after Modern Day Marine. For, for the Navy audience, you got to come to Modern Day Marine next year, because there's a lot happening. But the Marines are innovating. They're thinking big thoughts. They want to do more naval integration. There's some cool tech here, and uh, I just encourage more folks to come out. But uh, Scott, great to meet you. Thanks for your Thanks time again, today. sir. Thanks everybody out there. If I can help with anything, fire away. Let me know. Cool.